Hello and welcome to our today's webinar about the optimization of cool room design um, with the help of computational fluid dynamics. My name is Mila, yeah, and it's a big pleasure for me uh, to be your today's host. And before we start to dive in in our today's topic, I would like to introduce myself quickly. Um, I'm working as a product marketing manager here at SimScale for more than four years, and uh, in the past, uh, in the past ten years. I've worked in different industries uh, as a simulation engineer and simulation consultant. And as a part of my role at SimScale, I'm organizing and conducting workshops and webinars on uh, different topics to introduce new users to the world of engineering simulation. And now let's uh, take a quick look at our today's agenda. Um, so actually, this session is made out of two parts. At the beginning, the first 10 minutes, I will uh, briefly uh, discuss different aspects of uh, computational fluid dynamics and flow simulation. So we'll discuss what are the actual benefits using simulation. And I will also introduce you to our web and cloud-based simulation platform, SimScale. And after that, we will try to understand how fluid flow simulation can be used in the field of cold room and cold storage design. And we will, at the beginning, we will discuss some general things and we've also prepared a live demonstration for you. So this is a simulation project I would like to discuss with you, uh, which is uh, showing uh, on a hands-on way how to use CFD simulation to optimize the energy efficiency and the performance uh, of a cold room. And finally, we have a Q&A. So whenever you have a question, uh, feel free to write it uh, on the question uh, chat. And I will try to answer the question um, on the fly or latest during our Q&A. All right, let's get started and talk a little bit about simulations and, and what are the benefits. So to get uh, first things first, engineering simulation is a very general term. And often uh, CAE, computer aided engineering, is used as a synonym. And um, in the end, there is a lot of diff different definitions what simulation is. But in the end of the day, whenever we use engineering simulation, the idea is that we replace physical testing with uh, virtual experiments using computers and dedicated software. And therefore, this kind of tools can be very powerful. And one of the, yeah, let's say, most recognized uh, simulation tools is CFD, which stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics and can be translated to Fluid Flow Simulations. And yeah, in general, using Fluid Flow Simulation has a lot of advantages because it allows us to test the design a correctness and the efficiency of our final design without having the need to manufacture a prototype. And a lot of industries, this is quite obvious, for example, motorsport, especially F1 racing, was one of the big drivers of CFD in the past. And for them, it was a great tool because instead of manufacturing like, and you maybe know, it's the case you don't know, these F1 teams are redesigning the cars from race to race. And usually, uh, if they wanted to improve something, they had to build a, a model, put it in the wind tunnel, and measure it. And with CFD, uh, they can test a lot of concepts in the early design stage using only a computer. And these advantages can be adapted to nearly every industry. And for every industry, there's uh, some other effects which are important. However, using simulation helps us to reduce our time investment because uh, we don't need to, to wait for a prototype to be finished and, and usually simulation is much faster than physical testing. It also minimizes the risk of failure because um, usually uh, we can run much more simulations that we can do physical testing. So again and again we can test and validate our assumptions and make sure our design will last. And all this together finally help to reduce costs and to save a lot of money. And when it comes to the application, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different industries. And at SimScale, we have users from like AEC industry, automotive industry, valve industry. And uh, since our today's topic is, in, is somehow from the field of architecture, engineering, construction, I would also give you some examples how our customers are using our Simul CFD simulation tool for optimizing building projects and building designs. And that actually starts with HVAC design. So whenever you have an HVAC system inside a house, um, you can use simulation to optimize it. First of all, you can optimize and validate the performance of, of single parts like ducting elements, 
uh, and pipes, but you can also use it to simulate the airflow through the whole system and even to simulate the interaction between the airflow inside your HVAC system and, and the room which you want to um, supply with fresh air. And this cannot only be used in terms of performance gain, but also if you want to improve the efficiency. So, and that's also a big application for CFD. Wherever we have air flows, and wherever we have specially forced convection, um, it can really help to understand how to modify the design in order to reduce the energy demand. For example, you can like find uh, recirculation spots and stuff like that. But uh, CFD is also used for external aerodynamics of buildings, and uh, if you just think about long bridges or very tall skyscrapers, there the, the, the wind and the forces induced by the wind on the facade play a crucial role in the uh, yeah in the static of the building. And using CFD allows you also there to uh, save a lot of money and time and virtually test this because usually what you need to do is to run a wind tunnel test which takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money but um, yeah you can use it also to like uh, really optimize what is happening let's say on a, on a physical level for example you can use it to optimize the thermal comfort inside the room or inside the building and you can also use it for air quality control and contamination control. From what I've told you you must think well it sounds super nice and uh, if I tell you now that only 5% of the engineers have access to simulation, you might wonder yourself. However, this has some reasons. And this company, Simscale, was founded six years ago. And back then, what we wanted to do is to make engineering simulation accessible to every engineer in the world. And back then, we saw three main barriers, which are, you know, the reason why simulation is, is only a niche tool so far. And one of them was related to the high initial costs that you need to pay if you want to get started with simulation. So with traditional so-called on-premise simulation tools, you need to buy software license and dedicated hardware. You need to buy expensive training. And in the end of the day, you end up with an initial investment of, I don't know, 40, 50, 60,000 euro, and you have not even run one simulation. And especially for small companies, so if you just need it for, for certain projects, usually that's, that's not a good business case for the small engineering firms. On the other hand, even if the software and the hardware would be available for free, still traditional simulation tools require a lot of maintenance. So you need someone who is like installing a license server. Then you need someone to set up your computing infrastructure, to set up a post-processing visualization infrastructure, and so on. So it's not only related to the tools and the high initial investment, but you also need a lot of knowledge and, and, and people who are able to maintain your simulation environment. And the third and final barrier, which I think is maybe the most important, is what we like to call the knowledge barrier. So even if you have access to the tools and someone who can maintain the, the environment, uh, most of the simulation tools were designed for simulation experts and not for hands-on people like designers who want to use it just as a tool. Yes, and back then, uh, we stick our heads together and we came up with a new solution called cloud-based simulation and so SimScale is the world's first web and cloud-based simulation platform and that means you just need a, a standard computer with a standard web browser and internet connection and then you can run all your simulations through your web browser without need of installing some software uh, and all the simulation all the computation power is provided through the cloud and so this basically put simulation at the fingertips of every engineer in the world. And um, now I would like to very quickly discuss some of the mean USPs of SimScale and why this is, is really the uh, going to market tool for every engineer who wants to get started with engineering simulation. And the first point, which is really important, is what we call all-in-one. So usually when you have simulation tools, you need to buy and license every module separately. So there is like a structural mechanic module, there's a fluid dynamic module, a temperature thermodynamics module, and some scale is completely different. So actually, every all the users say, uh, share the same features. Everybody has access to the same kind of solvers and algorithms and all, stuff like that. And yeah, you can basically use it for whatever you want. And 
Besides the SIM scale, due to its cloud-based architecture, it's super fast and easy. So usually, when you run a, a larger simulation, you need to wait for weeks or even months until the simulation result is computed. And due to SimScale's cloud-based approach, you can use up to 96 computing cores uh, and run simulation from everywhere you want, from every device, any device you want. SimScale also allows real-time support and collaboration. So you can reach out to us, we use the success and support team via chat, phone, or email. And the support infrastructure is directly integrated to the platform, so you can directly share a project with them. Uh, show them if something is not working, directly create and share a screenshot inside SimScale. And besides this, we also offer consultancy uh, uh, trainings and, and uh, everything else which is needed to, to get you guys started. And what I like the most about SimScale is our price model because it's actually, you can say, cost efficient or even it's free because we have a so-called freemium pricing model which means that you can actually use the same simulation features without as a free user. The only difference is that your projects will become part of a public library. And if this is not an option for you due to you know commercial interest, we have professional plans with full privacy. And um, I already raised this uh, topic of real-time support. And this cloud-based approach also allows some unique features for collaboration. So we have the so we have the so-called SimScale community. Uh, where more than 120,000 users meet from around the world. And there you can connect with them, you can share your projects and know-how. And uh, uh, nevertheless, SimScale is still a high secure tool. So we are encrypting your data twice. And actually, we can, we even we cannot access your data without your permission and your password. All right, and that was my short introduction to the fundamentals of CFD and uh, to SimScale. And now I would like to talk with you about today's topic, which is the optimization of a cold room uh, with using CFD. And first of all, let's try to understand what we want to do today. So as you guys know, there are a lot of different applications where we need to cool down um, products. And a uh, very, uh, yes, let's say, famous example everybody knows is a cold room inside a supermarket. Um, but actually, it's really used everywhere. And when it comes to cool room design, our main aim for sure is to make sure that we have the right conditions, but we also want to reduce the energy consumption as much as possible. And yes, what and this is what we are going to do today. So in the next 20 minutes, I will show you how we optimized um, the operation conditions of a cold room using CFD. First of all, let's a short introduction. Um, let's take a look like what is the aim and what are the challenges of, of a cold room design. So um, as I mentioned, it's very important to maintain within and the recommended temperature range of, of uh, several products. Good example is fish and meat or even um, vegetables. Um, and depending on which, which kind of product you want to store in your cold room, you need other temperatures. And that's, by the way, your reason why in a fridge you have these different levels. And usually um, things which need to be cold, you put them uh, uh, at the lower shelf, why things which doesn't require such uh, low temperatures, you can put them, you know, in the upper shelf of your fridge. And especially when it comes to handle, uh, let's say, mat materials or products on a, on a commercial level, we're really talking about a big value. And if, like, the temperature is for, like, one hour below uh, uh, too high, you have to uh, throw away all the fish or all the meat. And uh, besides this, so besides the strict uh, requirement we have regarding the temperature, uh, we also at the same time have, you know, strict regulations coming up in, in um, regarding the energy performance requirements of, of such cold rooms. And due to rising energy prices, this is a challenge which needs to be solved by the industry. And if we just take a look at the market, you can see it's huge, like overall it's like a nearly 80 billion US dollar market in 2016 and it will massively grow in the next 10 years, more than double its um, market volume. And 
if you just think about it, we're talking about so much energy which is going to be wasted without some some major efficiency improvement of of uh, cold rooms. And this is exactly where we can use CFD. And now let's try to understand how we can use CFD for cold room design. And there are actually a lot of, of different things we can do. So in theory, you can really start to change and optimize the layout of the racks, for example, inside your cold room. But what we are going to do today, and what is most of the time the easiest and most obvious optimization, is to find the best combination between the flow rate in the and the inlet temperature. And this is our global aim. And, and we will do this in order to understand where we have hot spots and recollation zones, um, which can be very much related to the flow rate. Uh, but we will also optimize the design based on simulation results. We can also understand the effect of different insulations since we can consider the insulation effect as a boundary condition inside the simulation. And you can even play around like with the location of in and outlets. So there are a lot of unlimited number of possibilities uh, how you can play around with your design using CFD. And at the end of the day, you know, in, in several days or hours, you can like test and compare different designs and take the right design decision. And now let's do our today's live demonstration. And therefore we will try to, or we will optimize um, the operating condition of, of a cold room. And whenever we do a simulation with SimScales, we have three steps which we have to go through. The first step is what we call the CAT import. And as you know, um, uh, everybody, every company is using different CAT tools to design the, the, the cold room, for example. And the first very important step is to export your model in a proper way uh, and then upload it and import it to SimScale. And what you also need to do usually there is to clean up your model. So, for example, if you have small holes, uh, you need to close them, make sure your model is watertight and stuff like, stuff like that. The next step is what we call the simulation setup. And during the simulation setup, you have to create what we call, first of all, a mesh. And a mesh is this the structure you can see right now. And what we're doing, actually, we are dividing the domain of our cold room into a lot of small cells. And later, our, our simulation code will only calculate pressure and velocity and temperature values for the center of the cells. And with the density of, of your mesh, you're controlling, in the end of the day, the local accuracy of your simulation. And you can set up a simulation in your web browser, prepare everything, start them. And yes, after some time, your simulation results are finished. And then you can visualize the results in your web browser. You can download the results and take your design decision. And now let's take a look at our today's case. So this is the geometry we are going to, to analyze. Um, first of all, you can see we have the room. Inside the rooms, we have different kind of storage racks. And we have some inlets and some outlets. Uh, for sure, the inlets are in the near of the ceiling because the cold air should s uh, stream down due to natural convection. And first of all, I would like to show you how the simulation project looks on the SimScale platform. Therefore, let's switch our browser tab. and take a look at the project. And everything I'm doing here is inside my web browser. And I've, I'm logged in now on simscale.com. And I will open now this project, which was prepared by one of my colleagues. And now you see the SimScale user interface. And everything we do here, just keep it in your mind, it's happening inside our web browser. Okay, and the good, great thing is that our menu of our new workbench is really guiding you through all the steps. So the first step is to import the cat model. This is our cat model of, of, of the cooling room. And don't be confused. You should uh, keep in your mind that we are want to simulate the fluid domain. Therefore, our model is not representing the walls, but the domain inside the room. And yeah, here you have the outlets 
the inlet, the racks. And the next step is what we call meshing. So to, and then we have a lot of options. This is a more complex version is using this hex DOM in the parametric mesher where you have to define all the parameters by yourself, but we also support full automatic meshing. And if we take now a look inside, you can see for example that the mesh was automatically defined in the near off edges. So everywhere but we accept to have fast changes of the flow field of the flow field state. And once this is done you need to set up your simulation. And in this case, we have created two simulations. Let's start with the first one. The first step is to define which mesh you want to simulate. Then you choose a model for your physics. The material you want to simulate, in our case, air. And then you define like boundary conditions. So you define that these phases are inlets with a defined flow rate and temperature. These are outlets with a defined uh, uh, um, gauge pressure and so on. And once you are done, finally, you can run a simulation. You can see a set of simulation we have run. And if you go inside the simulation, you can like take a look at different things which are calculated, like the area averages of temperature, or even at this, you can take a look at the 3D results. And yeah, you should keep in mind that this is really a huge data set and just load it in several seconds since we are using a cloud-based approach. And now we can visualize it by, for example, by creating cutting plane. It's visualizing now the temperature, like we can change the opacity. And we can move it. We can change the representation from temperature, for example, to pressure or from pressure to velocity, like different components. You can also visualize the magnitude and for sure you can also change the scaling of the colors. Yeah, just some examples, but you can really analyze your result in the web browser or download them for local post-processing. No, let's. Proceed with our simulation. And in this case, we need to define which kind of material should be stored. And in our case, we will choose apple, carrot, and onion, so vegetable and fruits. And the defined temperature range there is between 273 and 277 Kelvin. But the recommended range is, is small. It's between 274 and 276 Kelvin. And in the middle, we have the idle, the perfect temperature. And yeah, these are the cases we have created. So once we've set it up the simulation, we combined or we had like uh, at all 20 simulations, 20 cases. And the only thing we changed was the inlet temperature and the inlet flow rate. And like we have created all combinations. And then we have calculated the average temperature maintained within the room for every simulation. And at the beginning, I mean, what is happening is obvious because as colder or as more air you supply to the system, it will reduce the average temperature. And now the question is, which of these combinations is the best in terms of performance, but also in terms of energy usage? And sometimes you really get very interesting results that for some defined geometry, some special combination seems to be very efficient of temperature and flow rate and the other way around. So let's take a, a look at some of the results. Before we do that, I want to raise one very important point. Whenever we are considering like heating or cooling of something, it's very important to, to know about the insulation model used. And in our case, what we did is that we calculated uh, the, the, the um, uh, conduction coefficient, K. And this is something you can do very easily. We just assume the insulation will be made or the wall will be made of 
14 centimeter of concrete and isolated with nearly 7 centimeter of polystyrene and you can just calculate the coefficient um, using this formula on the left and the effective coefficient is 0 0.085 and this coefficient was applied to all the outer walls which are not inlets or outlets or not parts of the rack. And yeah, now let's take a look at, at some of these combinations we investigated. So this is uh, the flow field, the temperature profile along the slice for an inlet temperature of 273 Kelvin and the uh, inlet velocity of 0 0.5 meters per second. And if you keep in mind that like our idle temperature is 275 Kelvin, which is around the, yeah, green every area. You can see that the whole system is undercooled. So we have this lower area, the temperature is okay, but everywhere where it's yellow or red, it's too high. And if we now take a look at the different slides from top and visualize both temperature velocity, we can also understand what the reason. So here you can see the, the air is, how the air is leaving the inlets and distributing the outer air flows distributing inside the plane and here you can really see like we have the small green spots do I have a pointer which I can use yes here the temperature is fine in this green area but everywhere else it's a little bit too high especially here we really have hot spots where it's definitely much too high. And if we take a look at the flow field, we can see that obviously the flow rate is still too low because as high as the flow rate is, as, as more um, will the airflow penetrate, you know, the, the static air in the room. But um, at the same time, so we need a kind of critical, we need a, at least a specific velocity value for the inlet. But on the other time, the, the amount of, and this is physically not correct, but if you think about it, the amount of cold energy is, is depending only on the, uh, on the uh, mass flow per second and on the temperature. And now let's take a look at the different slice, which is a little bit higher, and then it becomes, as higher we go, as worse it becomes. And here it's like everything is orange. So, and if you think about it, we are not, we're in the middle of the room and everything is much too hot. And you can see we have a lot of recirculations everywhere in the room. And now we have created a threshold which is showing the allowable range. And in the end of the day, um, we have a very big volume, very big space, which is massively undercooled, as you can see, and it's like 20 to 25 percent of the whole volume of our cold room. Now let's take another example where we have, on the one hand, a lower inlet velocity, but also a three time of the mass flux. And now it seems to be overcooled, because like every three, everything is cooler than it should be. And if you think about it, this at least uses uh, three times more energy than this solution. And it solves the problem, but on the other hand, it's overcooled at some points. And if we now compare again the, uh, the flow rate, first of all, we can see that we have a much bigger flow field. So with this low flow rate, only a small part of the room, we really had a, the air, air in motion. And now it's like we have everywhere a big global field. But as you can see, the temperature is not green. It's like too blue, it's too cold. It's basically the opposite now. That we have some that it's really at the most parts of the of the room it's much too cold. And if we now take a look at the allowable range, it's just the other way around. We don't have the problem that it's too hot, but nearly everything it's too cool, which is especially a problem for, for fruits and stuff like that. And now we will use a combination of the same temperature, but again only 0 0.5 meters per second uh, um, inlet velocity. And now you can see that this goes in two directions that we want to have. So uh, everywhere where we have this racks, the temperature is within the 
allowable threshold and um, it also looks much more homogeneous compared to the others where we had like a blue spot inside the plane or red spot and here uh, we still have there where the air is entering the room and we have like this hot layer on the top and the near of the ceiling for sure because of due to natural convection the, the warmer air is rising but everywhere where we have the racks the temperature is really within this, this threshold and the distribution is quite homogeneously and now let's again use our slices and here you can see like that well maybe beside here where the airflow from the inlet is hitting the first rack and here where it's a little bit too cold but it's not as critical it's still acceptable yeah this is like seems to be the best solution if we now take a look at the allowable range like nearly everywhere in the room uh, the conditions um, are as desired and what we did next is that we tried to calculate what we call a cost factor to understand what is the most efficient design and um, this table now summarizes all the runs we made and first of all you can see like like uh, the different combinations and you see that what was obvious that uh, for a too low inlet velocity everything is red but as more as we increase it as, as bad it becomes and using this cooling index now allows us to compare the energy consumption of different um, different configurations and also also in all of these green combinations we are like um, fulfilling the criteria so con this combination was in a temperature of 271 Kelvin and of velocity of 0 0.5 meters per second in that is the best uh, configuration because uh, we are within the recommended range and it has the lowest energy consumption of all and I mean this is logical because the global energy demand is in the end discussed by the flow rate and the, the temperature and obviously this is a combination with the lowest flow rate and the lowest temperature which is within the allowed range and therefore it's our winner and we can now bring this into a plot and yeah, it allows us also to like compare different solutions in terms of the characteristic and yeah here you can see like on the x-axis we have um, the temperature on the y-axis the velocity and you can see where our different configurations are laid and this is like our solution room what is marked here and now with state of simulation what we did is we explored this solution room and found the best design and best operating conditions and what I would also like to show you is how you can simulate like design changes for example if you use PUC as a uh, insulator which will result in a little bit different uh, effective conduction coefficient and if we now apply this with the same conditions on the exactly the same simulation it's still homogeneously cooled and without the insulation it was undercooled and this shows the two options we have like using a better insulation or we can modify the flow conditions and here you can see like it's actually again too cold now we comparable so the original insulation at the optimized insulation and, and actually if you insulate it too much you also need to modify the uh, inlet temperature and that's a, again a, a good example it's not only interesting for building a new cold room for stretch but also for optimizing a 16 cold room or discussing different options for for modernization this is definitely a great tool yeah, again you can see the difference for the highest slice at a chest level and you read the temperature drop by I would say at least two to three degrees Kelvin an average and yeah this is a also a very interesting slide because if we modify the legend bar 
and optimize the insulation and consider what's happening above the racks. Um, you can see that um, uh, the effect is not as, as, as big anymore. Yeah, and that's actually it. And we can summarize uh, what we can do around insulation with CFD. So um, we can use um, insulation or optimum insulation uh, to overcool the domain. That allows us to decrease the temperature to almost one degree, and this is a big advantage. And it allows us also like to understand if the one-time investment cost for optimal insulation helps to cut the overall cost by reducing the flow rate required, uh, or in the end of the day, if it does not make sense from a financial point of view because the insulation is more expensive than the, the cost of using more flow rate over the, the life cycle. And these are in the end the three parameters we have whenever it comes to designing a um, cool room. So we have the inlet temperature, the inlet flow rate, and the insulation properties. And all these things can be optimized and we can play around with them using CFD. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, your attendance. And now I, uh, we have time for a Q&A. So I already answered some of the questions in the chat. But in the case you have a question, just write in the chat box and I will try to answer it. Well, it seems like most questions were answered. In the case uh, you want to, uh, to, to reach out to me or to my colleagues, just drop an email to mmafi at simscale.com with your question and then we can also try to answer it after the webinar. Yes, I would like to, to uh, thank everyone. It was a great pleasure to be here today's host. I hope you learned something, enjoyed the session, and yeah, see you soon. Oh, there is a, a last question by Ramon. Hi, Ramon. So let me know how I can help you. So what is your question regarding SimScale? Raman wants to know if there is an automatic way of running the cases well. It's not 100% fully automatic, but actually modifying the cases and cr took maybe five minutes. I can quickly demonstrate that. So what you do is you go to your simulation project and you just need to change the flow rate value and the temperature value and create a new, for example, let's make it now very hot. Then I just go on, create a new simulation run. It took how long? 10 seconds? And that's how we do it. All right, I hope that answered your question. And if there are no more questions, yes, I wish you a, a great, okay. And all the questions came, perfect. Raul wants to know what are the conditions of the pressure inlet? Well, um, whenever it comes to model a, a flow, uh, you know, usually flow is pressure driven, which means you define on one inlet, you define the, the velocity and the other you define the gauge pressure. And now a case, the difference pressure should be zero. So that's why we use zero. So, but it's actually, you can use what, what every number in this case because it's incompressible. And in the end of the day, this is just defining your, um, you know, your um, level of pressure. I hope that helped. All right. Thank you very much for the time. And yeah. And um, okay, you have another question, Ramon. Uh, yeah, let me know. How can I? What? What? What do you want to know? Oh, regarding the captain pot. Yeah. Good point. We support a lot of different file formats, so I can show it to you. If you want to import a new file, just click on Upload. Then you can upload the local file from your file system, and we support like AutoCAD, Rhino, SolidWorks, so you can import the native CAD files. 
but you could also use exchange formats like STEP, IGES or STL. And you can directly push your geometries from Onshape to SimScale. Did this answer your question, Raman? Oh, regarding buildings. Well, a lot of our customers use Rhino to design the buildings and, and some of them also AutoCAD. And um, in the end of the day, you will, f in a you will find a file format for every CAD application which works since we all support STL, OBG, STEP and IGES. So it's possible. Hope that answered your question, Raman. And if you have uh, oh, perfect. And, and um, if you have uh, other questions related to file formats, also feel free to reach out to my colleagues from support. And Julian, Julian Lindfeld wants to know where are the limitations in comparison to other programs that are on offline? Well, that's a good question. In the end of the day, um, all the simulation tools, all the CFD tools uh, have very similar features. Um, we would lie if we say that we have exactly the same amount of features like, like tools which are on the market for 30 years. But regarding um, internal flows and everything related to the AEC industry, I think we have all features needed and we uh, don't, we're not afraid to, to be compared with, with offline tools. So feel free to test with other tools. I, I would not say that anything important is really missing. But uh, for sure, everybody has a different opinion on that. Okay. Um, Julian um, mentioned that he used the BIM HVAC tool and he did do a lot of work in the open foam code. But and he wants to know if it's necessary with SimScale. No, we are using also open foam at SimScale in our backend, but you don't need to touch any kind of code. So everything you do, it's done with our GUI. And that's why I, I meant when I said SimScale is the first simulation tool, not designed for simulation expert, but for designers themselves. And um, if if um, you're interested in, in more HVAC stuff, we also have some webinars, Julian, you should take a look at on our website, focusing exactly on that question, how to use SimScale for investigating thermal comp or other stuff like that. There's another question. So it seems like you were shy in the beginning. Raul wants to know more about the mesh of the racks, how many elements were used. So yeah, let's take a look. That is straightforward, we'll just hide assignment and you can see like approximately 10 elements which is fine for the volume mesh. You should not forget that we have a very low Reynolds number for this case compared to, to other aerodynamic phenomena so this should be fine. All right, yes. I hope I answered all your question. And if there is something you forgot about to ask, just reach out to me by email. I wish you a very nice weekend and see you soon. Bye.